For those who are uh, joining us uh, this morning, we're going to be sharing part two in a two-part series we're doing dealing with the subject of turning your trials into triumph. I think we all know that there are trials in life. Uh, there are struggles in life. It goes all the way back to the beginning when Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And what was that fruit called? Not an apple. It was the knowledge of good and evil. And that just seems to be the lot of man in life. We've all inherited a combination of good and evil. I was thinking even during this morning, you know, we're hearing about the celebration of a wedding and the sadness of a funeral. And, you know, there are trials in life. Job said in Job chapter 2, verse 10, Job, who was a man that was great and blessed, when all this adversity fell upon him, he said to his wife, Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Jesus said, Your heavenly Father sends the sunshine and the rain on everybody. Good and bad get good and bad. And so how do we as Christians process and how can we make the most of the various trials that might come to us in life? The Lord wants us to be able to uh, take advantage of these things to grow and to learn. Now, please don't be discouraged or don't be afraid when I tell you that you're going to have problems in life. Uh, there are trials in life, and as time goes by, you, you sometimes face more, and God gives you more strength to endure and bear those things. But don't be afraid. Jesus was very clear. Even in a storm, he told his disciples, why are you afraid? Fear not, fear not, fear not. As someone once said that a man who fears suffering is already suffering from what he fears. Just makes it worse. So don't, don't live in fear of those things. God will not allow you to be tested above what you're able. Amen? You've got a loving Heavenly Father that will measure what He allows you to go through, and He will then give you the strength to endure those things. Thomas A. Kempis, and I don't know if you've ever read uh, the primary book by Thomas A. Kempis, but it, it's rather profound. It talks about how you can walk with God and have a, a Christ-like attitude. He said, He who knows how to suffer will enjoy much peace. Such a one is a conqueror of himself, the Lord of the world, a friend of Christ, and an heir of heaven. And Helen Keller said, Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of overcoming of it. So there are trials in life, and then God, he gives us ways to overcome. We're, we're going to talk a little bit, and this is part two. I told you I'd give you about five more reasons or ways that we can see these trials turned into triumph. And um, the first thing I should mention, one of the most important ways is to avoid suffering by avoiding sin. And I hope this is obvious to everybody, but a whole lot of suffering that comes into our life is the consequence of bad decisions that we make. You could be free from a lot of trials and suffering that are self-induced because of bad choices that we make. And the Word of God is pretty clear on that. Proverbs 13, 15, Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. It is easier to be a Christian than to be lost. Life is tough, but it is easier to be saved than to be lost. People say, oh, I don't want to be a Christian. It's so hard. It's a lot harder to be lost. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. And Jesus says, my yoke is what? Easy. My burden is light, Matthew 11. And so just right away understand, it's going to be easier for you to follow Jesus. Which was easier for the children of Israel, to be slaves in Egypt serving Pharaoh with no hope, or to follow Jesus, or the Lord, through the wilderness on the way to the promised land? They were both tough, but it was a lot easier to be free and have God in their presence than to be hopeless slaves in Egypt. And that's really your choice. You can either be a slave of the devil and miserable, or you can make your way to the promised land and there's going to be trials along the way, but it is so much better. Amen? Amen? And yet even the children of Israel got discouraged and said, I wish I was back in Egypt. So if you're a Christian and sometimes you think it's so hard to be a Christian, well, that's normal, but it's a lot harder to be lost. 
Don't forget that. Jesus is a much better master than the devil. So there is good and there is evil in life. Praise the Lord. God can take, if you're a believer, you know Romans chapter 8, all things will work together for good to the one that loves God. I remember hearing an interesting story that in uh, Central Africa, the English had an outpost somewhere in the Congo and there was a captain there. This is back in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And the captain had a servant named John, the English captain. He was an African and he was a Christian. He had been converted and he was very positive. And they worked together and he'd often take him on hunts together. The captain would go out in the jungle with John and they'd hunt and they spent a lot of time together. He was sort of like his personal attendant. And uh, he really liked John, except he had this one habit that was very annoying that no matter what happened, he always said, ah, this is good. Ah, this is good. If it was raining, he'd say, ah, this is good. Captain would say, why is it good? It's going to be all muddy. He said, there'll be no dust. This is good. <laughs> and if it was hot and dry, he'd say, ah, this is good. He said, why is this good? There'll be no mud. <laughs> A lightning struck someone's hut, burned it down. He said, ah, this is good. He says, why would you say this is good? He says, I don't know, but everything God does is good. <laughs> and in a few days, the village got together and built them a bigger and a better hut. He said, I told you, this is good. <laughs> and so this went on for quite a while until one day, the English captain and John were off hunting with a small band of soldiers uh, in the jungle, and he saw this prize buck impala. And this is back before they had the, you know, regular repeating rifles. And you had to pour the gunpowder in and put the shot in. And, and John took care of the rifle for the captain. He put in the powder and he put in the shot. And he gave it to the captain. Captain aimed. Boom. The gun blew up in his face. It misfired. It was a very dangerous operation back then. Burnt the hair off his face. And worst of all, it blew off the tip of his finger. And the buck got away. And the captain is there hopping up and down and he's grabbing his finger. And you know what John said? Ah, this is good. And the captain got so angry, he ordered the soldiers to take him back and put him in the cellar. Put him in jail. And so they carried off John and they put him in jail. And he stayed there for a month in the barracks in their cellar. And the captain's finger started to heal up a little bit and he went out by himself to go hunting and wanted to see if he could pull the trigger with his other finger and uh, while he was off on this excursion he was captured by another tribe that carried him off and they were going to sacrifice him and they practiced cannibalism and just before they executed him the witch doctor came over and looked him over and saw he was missing the tip of his finger and there was a great hubbub, and the outcome was, they said that the ancestors would not accept anything but a perfect sacrifice. They said, now you must let him go. So the captain was freed, and while he's making his way back to the outpost, he's thinking, you know, missing the tip of my finger saved me. John was right, and here I put him in jail for a month, and he was my friend. So he gets back, and brings John out of the cellar and said, I'm so sorry, you were my friend and because of that one accident, it might have even been the rifle, I don't know, he got, uh, got mad at you because, oh, this is good. He said, I put you in the cellar. He said, will you forgive me? He said, it is no problem. He said, it is good. <laughs> he said, how can you say it is good that you were in the cellar? He said, well, I, I prayed more in the cellar and if I was with you, they would have eaten me. All things work together for good. Amen. To them that love God. Okay, well, I told you I was going to give you five more ways that your trials can be turned into triumph. Number one, trials grow Christian virtues. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, 
Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. Notice the word trial. That the trying of your faith be much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it is tried with fire, fiery trials. It might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We want to be found ready for the appearing of Jesus Christ. Trials is one of the ways that God gets us ready. It's helping us to develop those Christian virtues. You read in Romans 5, verse 3, and not only that, but we glory in tribulations. And we're talking trials, tribulation, same thing. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character. Talking about the right kind of character and character, hope. And what produces that? Tribulations. If you embrace the trials as something from your heavenly Father and say, Lord, let me learn whatever it is you want me to learn and know that it's for your good, then you'll be blessed. You probably heard before about a lot of raptors like eagles that when they first build their nest, they get all the sticks and they get smaller sticks and then they, they end up putting in some uh, down and they make the nest very soft and they collect the, this down in the cattails and things. They make this soft bed inside because they don't want the chick on the sticks and the rocks and the bones that are in there. And they lay their eggs. And then when the eggs hatch, they, the mother and father eagle, bring all the food and those little chicks, they grow and they get big and they sit on the edge of the nest and they flap their wings and finally the parents, you know, the bigger they get, the more they eat. Have you discovered that? And eventually, you got to get them out of the nest or they're going to eat you out of house and home. So you know what the parents do? They stop bringing very much food. And the young birds start flapping their wings. And if they don't get out of the nest quick enough, then what they do is they start taking all the down out of the nest. All the soft stuff, soft stuff is taken out of the nest. And you know, they've been eating these little critters and so there's like sharp bones and there's rocks and there's sticks and the birds just get so uncomfortable. They can't even get down in the nest anymore. They're up on the edge all the time trying to flap their wings to catch their bounce. And that's how the parents ultimately teach them to launch. They make them uncomfortable so they can learn to fly. Sometimes your heavenly father will make you uncomfortable so you can learn to fly. And you wonder, why is this? Don't they love me anymore? Why'd they take all the down out of the nest? Oh, it's because they do love you that this happens. So he does it to let us grow Christian virtue. Psalm 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Well, that's pretty clear and to the point. Someone pointed out once that the... Um, the trees with the most valuable wood and the finest grain are the ones that grow on the mountain beaten by the storms. The trees that get hit by all the storms develop the tightest grain because they're always being tested and shaken. And God helps us develop these Christian virtues by trial. Okay, point number two. Trials help us to empathize with others. You know, Job was uh, afflicted, and I felt really sorry for Job when I realized all he went through, but I have been encouraged. When I go through trouble, I can always almost say, always, well, it isn't as bad as Job. I mean, I'm having a hard time, but people have had it much worse. His suffering has been a source of comfort to me, and it helps me to empathize with others. So if you're going through a hard time, who do you turn to? Isn't it going to be somebody who's also experienced trials? I remember going to a church once where this young pastor just got out of seminary. He's not married yet. And he stood up and he's preaching a sermon on how to be successful in marriage. I can't even grow a beard yet, you know. And, and I'm thinking to myself, what's he going to teach me about marriage? <laughs> he doesn't even have a girlfriend. <laughs> what does he know? But when you get a seasoned minister that's been up there married to the same gal for 50 years and he tells you, I'm going to tell you the secrets to a happy marriage. You sit on the edge of your seat. because He knows something. He's been through it. You see what I'm saying? 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in our tribulation. Why? That we might be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. We can console others because of what we've suffered. Now, if we are afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. Or if we're comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. A lot of times what you're going through, as I mentioned before, it's not only because God is trying to teach us and reach us, but what you experience is going to be a source of encouraging and helping others along the way. You can empathize with them. I remember hearing about a man that said they went to the hospital and they had this surgery, maybe in gallbladder or something, I don't know, but they had this surgery, it was rather painful. And um, the man was saying that one day the nurse came in to dress his wound and she had to also, you know, give him a little spit bath and of course they don't call it that in the hospital and, um, and, and roll him over and she was so hurried and rough and he's going, ow, ooh, tearing the bandage off and you're just dabbing the scar and he's, ow, ooh, you know, and she just didn't seem to have much compassion and wasn't very feeling and he couldn't wait until she left the room. The next day it was time for a similar treatment. Different nurse came in, very gentle, slowly took off the bandage, great deal of compassion. And as she was getting ready to leave, he says, wait a second, wait a second, come back here for just a second. He said, why are you so gentle and so kind? Said, I had Nurse Ratchet yesterday. And she said, she just roughed me up and tore off the bandages. I don't understand it. He, she said, well, I'm not sure. But he said, she said, all I can tell you is I had the same surgery that you had. I know how you feel. Sometimes when we go through a hard time or a trial, it makes us a lot more empathetic with other people. And as a young pastor, I do a funeral. Well, I hadn't really experienced much death in my life. And um, it was sort of a little more perfunctory. But as the years go by and you lose mother and brother and father and son, and then you do a funeral, you have a lot more empathy and sympathy when you've been through the trials yourself. You know what I'm saying? So this is one reason God allows it so we can care. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Praise God. But in all points was tempted as we are, yet without sin. When you pray, can you ever say to Jesus, well, Lord, you don't know what it's like. He knows what it's like, doesn't he? First of all, he knows what it's like because he's God and he knows everything. But part of the reason the Lord came to earth and went through what he went through is so we would know that he knows what it's like because we know that he was a man and he lived in this world and went through all kinds of trials. Isaiah 53 verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Point three, how do we turn our trials into triumph? Trials create an opportunity to witness. Now this is one of my favorite parts of the message today. If you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, I'd like to read it with you real quick. Acts chapter 16, and this is the story of Paul and Silas when they are in prison. I'm going to back up and give you the background. You go to verse 16, Acts 16, 16, you can find that. Now what happened is we went to prayer. They're doing ministry in Philippi. It happened as we went to prayer, Paul and Silas, that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by her fortune telling. She's into the occult and evidently she's connected with the devil. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, Luke is writing, cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, was there anything untrue about what she said? No, it was absolutely true. Will the devil sometimes mix truth to get credibility before he shares lies? And Paul knew what she was up to. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, he finally turned around and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. 
And he, the devil, came out of her that very hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their prophet was gone, they were outraged. The devil doesn't like it very much when uh, he's cast out of his territory. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive and observe. Then the multitude stirred into a fury. They rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes, and they commanded them to be beaten with rods, which, by the way, was illegal to do to a Roman citizen. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they got beaten severely, innocent. They threw them into prison. That'd be a terrible trial to be beaten, falsely accused, thrown in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. The jailer, having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison. There's no air conditioning, and it's uncomfortable. He fastens their feet in the stocks. Okay, you get the picture? It says, then at midnight. So Paul and Silas, earlier in the day, they're on their way to prayer. The devil doesn't like it when you pray. Say, Lord, we were just going to pray. We cast out a devil. Isn't that a good thing? And then we got falsely accused. We got beaten. We were put in prison, put in the stocks, in a dark innermost cell. What would you do? I'd probably complain. I'd feel sorry for myself. I'd be singing a dirge. But it says at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. In their trial, they are praising God. And because they're praising God and glorifying God in their trial, look at what happens. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all of the doors were opened and everybody's chains were loosed. Now, this is an earthquake caused by an angel. It's not seismic activity. Because a very odd earthquake where all of a sudden all the doors open up and the chains fall off. You with me? Earthquakes usually don't take handcuffs off. Everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open. See, if a jailer back then lost his charge, he was executed. You read in Acts 12, when those jailers lost Peter, Herod had him killed. So when the jailer woke up, supposing the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and was about to fall on it like King Saul. And Paul called out saying, do yourself no harm. Now, if it was me and the guy had whipped me, I'd say, go for it. <laughs> but Paul loves his enemies. He says, do yourself no harm for we're here. Not only were Paul and Silas here, but all the prisoners were still there. You notice something I ran past. It says they were singing hymns and the prisoners were listening to them. Other people in prison are listening and watching to see how you act in trial. It says, we're all here. The jailer called for a light and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Well, a little bit ago, they were before the jailer being beaten. Now he's before them. And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Don't you love to hear that question? What brought them to that? They're singing through their dark trials at midnight. So they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now it doesn't mean that you save your household just by you believing. You keep reading. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. The whole household heard the word. He took them home. Jailer's house was usually adjoining the jail. And he took them the same hour that night and he washed their stripes and immediately he and his whole family were baptized. Isn't that wonderful? And when he had brought them into his house, he said food before them and rejoiced. He was going to commit suicide a few hours early. He rejoices having believed in God with all of his household. What a wonderful story, friends. How through their faithfulness, in this trial and they're praising God not only is a jailer and his family saved but you notice everybody's chains are loosed this is what happens if we are faithful when we are going through suffering and trials you are always the best witness in your trials when does the light shine the brightest when it's dark 
and in the darkness, in our trials, is when we sometimes have the very best opportunity to witness for God. You know, there's another story in the Bible that relates to this. It says, from the sufferings of Jesus prison on the cross, notice what happened. Now I'm going to read a combination of two verses. John 19, verse 30, and Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, hanging on the cross, last thing he says, he says, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus gives a testimony of glory, of faith in God. Having said this, he bowed his head, he breathed his last, he gave up his spirit. Then behold, Matthew 27, 51, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth quaked. We just read about an earthquake in Acts 16. The earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened. When they had the earthquake in Acts, did something open? You with me? We just read Acts chapter 16. There was an earthquake. Paul and Silas were giving glory to God in their trial. And there was an earthquake and the prison doors were open and the handcuffs were loosed. Jesus gives glory to God from the cross in his sufferings. There's an earthquake. Graves are open. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the city and appeared to many. They are going and giving testimony to many. But wait, there's more. The soldiers who were there at the crucifixion, look in Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. So when the centurion and those who were with him, not just the centurion, those who were with him, they saw the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Christ going through his sufferings with patience and praising God. Witness to the soldiers at the cross. They came to say, this was the Son of God by the testimony of Christ. Sometimes, one of the best things that can happen for us is to go through trials. Um, and that's how God gets us ready for use. Any of you remember when you'd buy medicine and on the bottle it would say, shake well before using? Anyone? It's that way if you use like almond milk. Shake well before using. <laughs> you know, sometimes we ought to have a label on us. It says, shake well before using. You want God to use you? He might need to shake you well before he can witness through you. Amen? Amen. Point number four. Trials help us to focus on eternity. Helps us keep perspective. Romans 8.8 8, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to which, uh, which is going to be revealed in us. It is so much easier to go through our trials and to bear them. First of all, if you know it's temporary. In case you didn't know, friends, this is not it. This life is not it. This is actually very small compared to what will really be it. Eternity is what ought to be filling our mind, keeping the big perspective. You know, sometimes you'll see a boxer in the middle of the ring and they're bludgeoning each other and you think, how can they stand that? Well, they're about to get two million dollars. That's really a great motivator. And the reward helps them stay on their feet as long as possible. Do you remember the reward? 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction. We are afflicted. How does Paul refer to it? Now, have you ever listened to what Paul went through? Uh, beaten with rods three times. Shipwrecked twice. Spent a night and a day in the sea. Uh, you know, stoned. Yeah, I was stoned to death once. <laughs> you listen to Paul and Paul says, our light affliction our light affliction, which is but for a moment compared to eternity. How long is it? Our light affliction, which is for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. What do we look at? You want to turn your trials into triumph? Focus on the finish line. Focus on the victory. Focus on heaven. It makes it a lot easier to bear I had to go to the doctor a few weeks ago. I've got arthritis in one of my toes, and it hurts. I think Denise the other day said, Doug, you're limping. I said, my leg's fine. My toe hurts. Well, the doctor said, come in. I'm going to give you a shot. You'll be okay. He took a needle. 
And he said, now, I've got to push this between the two bones. I'm going, he says, you're going to feel a lot better when it's over. <laughs> so I had to stand there like a man. What I want to do is scream like a baby. And I stand there, I said, okay, go ahead. And it, it hurt for a moment. But then when he got done, I pretty soon some Novocaine, I think, set in. It didn't hurt anymore. But I was able to resist the temptation to get up and run out of his office when I saw that needle because I thought, it'll hurt for a moment, but it's going to be better for a long time. And that's the way it is in this world, friends. Keep your mind focused on things above where God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes and there's no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Notice this, nor any more pain, no more suffering, no more death. The former things have passed away. By the way, these are the things we ought to be talking about. Sometimes we focus on the negative. There's a beautiful book called Faith and Works, page 76. If you have a voice to say anything, talk of God, talk of heaven, talk of eternal life. James 5.10, my brethren, take the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Uh, Karen and I were talking today, and she said, you ever look at Jeremiah? He's called the weeping prophet. Boy, he went through it. He's got a whole book called Lamentations. Now, I'm not suggesting that you spend all your time in Lamentations, but some of them had some really tough times. Listen to what James says. You've heard of the perseverance of Job, and you've seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Job is doubly blessed in the end. You look at the book of Job, and it's terrible, but you realize all of Job's sufferings out of the 200 plus years that he lived happened in a matter of weeks. And the other 200 years, doubly blessed. So we sometimes spend our whole lives worried about that time of trial that we might go through, and we forget about all the blessing that God wants to give us. You know, I uh, was reading a little bit in history, and it talked about that um, the Delaware Indians, if they captured some of the people back during the time of the Revolutionary War, uh, they'd make their decision on whether or not they'd let you live or even if you could be adopted in the tribe, you had to do something called run the gauntlet. You ever heard that expression? There are different cultures have done, even some military, they do this, say you run the gauntlet. You've got to run through this row of, of warriors that were facing each other and they all had sharp sticks or whips or clubs and you had to run through, you know, like 50 of them on each side and depending on how you conducted yourself going through, if you cried out or if you gave up, they'd kill you. But if you made it through, they'd say, well, you've got courage. We'll adopt you into the tribe or we'll let you live. You had to run the gauntlet and stand up against all the beatings that you might receive. Well, there's a gauntlet in life of various trials, friends. And Jesus said, he that endures to when? The end will be saved. Don't give up. The devil wants to discourage us. Point number five. Trials remind us to be thankful. First of all, thank the Lord it's not always that way. For the good times, you can look where Job, during his trials, he looks back on the times of his blessing. Job 29, verse 4, Just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me, when my steps were bathed with cream and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. Sometimes you and I are living through times of incredible blessings and we forget about it until you're going through suffering and then you know what you say in the time of suffering? Those were the good old days and we didn't even know it. Right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything giving thanks. 2 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, it says, As unknown, yet well known, as dying, and behold we live, as chastened, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. And even Job could say, 
Chapter 35, verse 10, my maker who gives songs in the night, in our times of darkness, he can still give us songs like Paul and Silas at midnight. Amen? Got to learn how to praise God. Some of the best songs are written during times of trial. Now, since you've been good, I've added one more. I won't do like Pharaoh who would not let people's go, God's people go. I will let you go eventually. <laughs> glorify God. Why do we go through suffering? To glorify God. What's the three angels' message? Give glory to God. John 9, 2. It came to pass... They saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples said, Lord, why was this man born blind? Was it his sin or his parents? Jesus said, neither, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Sometimes you're going through a trial and you don't understand it, but somehow God is going to be glorified in what you're going through. 1 Peter 4.13, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, the Bible says if we suffer with Christ, it's a reason to rejoice. That when his glory shall be revealed, you might be glad also with exceeding joy. John 21, 18, Jesus told Peter, when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death, crucifixion, Peter would glorify God. As a matter of fact, when Peter was finally crucified by Nero, he made the request. He said, I am not worthy to die as my master. Would you please crucify me with my head down? And they complied according to tradition. The apostles were beaten for preaching about Jesus. Acts 5.41 So they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. If you are being persecuted for righteousness, what does Jesus say? Rejoice and be, not just glad, be exceedingly glad. This is what they did to your master. He said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And friends, some time of persecution may be coming. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. If heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we might be glorified together. Don't be stunned if you go through suffering in life. Your master did, and if he can be glorified in it, your love for him should be so strong. It may not be there yet, but God wants us to have that kind of love where if he can be glorified, we will be happy to suffer for his name's sake. I remember hearing about a pastor that it was in Southern California, and they were having a drought. So what's new, right? And they noticed that all these orange groves were drying up and dying. But in the middle of all these orange groves, there was one square owned by this particular farmer, and the trees were all green. And there was no irrigation water, and so they couldn't understand. The pastor was there, where some reporters were going around saying, why are your trees all alive and all these other trees are dying? He said, well, I know a lot about orange trees. And he said, when they were young, he said, I didn't water them too much. I'd water them, and then I'd hold back the water. And it forced their roots to go deeper. I'd water them a little bit, and then I'd let them get thirsty. And I watched the leaves carefully and know when they were at that critical point, And they would be pushing their roots deeper. And he said, these trees can survive a lot longer in a drought because their roots have gone deeper because they've experienced hardship. Now, I don't know if you know, friends, but there's a time of trouble coming to our world. And if we're going to have a faith that's going to stand up, if our tree is not going to get blown over in that storm, we need roots. Amen? And one way to have those roots is to embrace the trials that come now. If we are faithful in those things that are least, we will ultimately be faithful in much. Just know whatever you're going through, God loves you. All things work together for good to those that love God. Amen? Amen. And you've got to learn to say with John, ah, this is good. <laughs>